Welcome to this module of Professor Messer's CompTIA a certification training course on identifying memory. I'm James Messer. I'm going to be your guide through this module that's going to really address a number of pieces of identifying memory from the 220-601 Essentials exam. Section 1-1 says that we have to identify the names, purposes, and characteristics of memory, and specifically the types of memory. And what that means is as we go through this module, you're going to find there are a lot of abbreviations as we go through form factors. And you're also going to see a lot of different kinds of memory pop up, static RAM, dynamic random access memory, synchronous DRAM. You're going to find a lot of abbreviations. You're going to find there's a lot you're going to have to memorize as far as the number of pins on things like RAM bus, DRAM, and double data rate SD RAM. So, don't be put off that there's so much here that you're going to have to remember. Just think about knowing that you have to know these abbreviations, know this type of memory, and what we're going to step through today. Now, what I'm not going to go through is probably just as important, because with all of those things that you have to learn, there's certain things that are just not on the a exam. But there are terms that might come up in answers on the a exam just to throw you. So I thought I'd throw some of these terms out. One of the older types of memory is called SIM. We're not going to talk about SIMs today. There's also an older type of memory called fast page mode or FPM DRAM. We're not going to talk about that either. Another thing you're not going to learn today is extended data out, EDO RAM. Another term that you will see come up as an answer is one of the multiple choice answers on your exam. But since I'm telling you that we're not going to learn about it, you can automatically discount that as being an answer on your A plus exam. And finally, burst EDO or B E D O. DRAM, another type of RAM we're not really going to talk about today with what we're going to be doing. And finally, DDR3, which is a brand new type of SD RAM. And although it is something that is in the newest computers, the certification exam for A plus is still a couple of years behind. It's a 2006 version of this. So perhaps the next version of the A plus exam will have DDR3 on it. But for the time being, we don't have to worry about that too much. That's for the next iteration of Professor Messer's free CompTIA exam videos. Let's start with talking about memory form factors. This is a DIM. DIM stands for a dual inline memory module. And they're about 133 millimeters by 38 millimeters. So they're not very big, but when you start looking at them, those are our, our different sizes. You can see this is a very standard type of memory module these days. It's called a dual inline memory module because we're looking at one side of this memory module right now. And you can see all of these little tiny gold pins at the bottom. Those are the connectors that go into the memory slot on our motherboard. There's also a duplicate set of those on the other side, but they're not connected to each other. This has dual inline memory module means that each side of this memory is completely separate in the way that it works. This has a width or bandwidth for memory to the bus of 64 bits. So this is an 8 byte data width memory module. Now, these days, it's a very common size for memory, a very efficient size for memory as well, since many processors these days are 32 and now 64 bit processors. So very efficient to be able to use those. You'll see this particular kind of package used for SDRAM, which has 168 pins, DDR, type memory, which has 184 pins, and DDR2, which has 240 pins. And that's something that I should probably mention at this point as we go through this talk about these, these memory devices and the form factors. These form factors can be used for different memory types. And so I thought I'd give you a feel for the what the memory type is and show you as you move from different types of memory, a similar package, but a different number of pins here at the bottom. And those are things you're going to have to know for the A plus exam. So just keep that in mind. There is another type of memory you really don't see much anymore called a RIM. This stands for RAM Bus Inline Memory Module. And this was created by a company called RAM Bus Incorporated. And it was created to address a gap in the speeds of memory 
as we moved into the Pentium world. You'll also notice this memory looks a little bit differently. It has this metal shield all around it. And that's because this memory gets very hot. And what that memory shield does is dissipate some of the heat off of those memory chips. We haven't seen a lot of those, although some of the memory recently does have shields like this on it. So it doesn't mean anything that's different about the memory and the way that it works, only in the type of the way that it, it gets rid of some of the heat, the way it dissipates heat off of that. In fact, if you wanted to buy your own heat dissipation for a memory module, you can buy those off the shelf as well. There's no reason you can't. But every single RAM bus inline memory module you find is going to have this memory shield on it. It was part of the specification. There's different kinds of RIMs. There's a 16-bit and 32-bit. But we really don't see those anymore. They had to be installed in pairs inside of a motherboard. And you, what you'll find is if you're only using one module, you had to have this essentially a blank on your motherboard to fill in the rest of the slots that you weren't currently using. These 16-bit blanks were called continuity RIMs or CRIMs. You'll also see them described in the later modules, these 32-bit modules, as continuity and termination RIMs, CT RIMs. So uh, this is a type of memory that was used a lot at the time. But since it was something that was only temporarily within this a certain time frame and it was licensed, there were a lot of reasons behind that. We'll talk more about that in a moment. You really don't see them much any longer. Longer. If you have a laptop, what you may find inside of that is something called a SODEM or small outline DIM. This is what's in my laptop. And they're very small, which makes it perfect to go into a laptop. And there's different types of versions for this one as well. There's a 72 pin, 144 pin, and 200 pin versions of this, depending on the type of memory that's running on this, whether it's a DDR or DDR2. Uh, you'll see it a lot in laptops, although sometimes you'll see it in desktop systems that would like to keep a very small form factor. Because they're a little bit smaller, they're a little bit more expensive. So most manufacturers, if you're going to have a desktop machine, which has a lot of room on the motherboard, relatively speaking, than a laptop, then they'll just use the standard size DIMMs. But the SODIMM is a very common one that you will see. Another common, very small type of memory module you'll see is something called a micro DIMM. And a micro DIMM is even smaller than a SODIMM. It's about half the length of a SODIMM. And it also has a 64 bit bus on it. So it's used in some of the more modern portable devices. But because it is very small, you'll see this used in portable devices that are perhaps aren't even personal computers. They may be MP3 players or very mobile, very tiny laptop computers. There are are 144 pin and 172 pin versions of this. So these types of memory containers are used across many different kinds of memory. And hopefully, that's given you a little bit of an overview of what you can expect to see from the physical packages of the memory modules and the number of pins associated with those packages. Now that we know what memory looks like and how it's packaged, let's talk about the memory that's on the modules themselves, the types of memory. The first one we'll talk about is one that's not on a module. It's called static RAM. This is very, very fast memory. And it's memory that is very expensive as well. That's why you don't have static RAM all over your system. Static RAM is nice, but it also takes up a lot of real estate, which means if you have static RAM, you probably don't have a whole lot of it in your system. There's just not enough room to put it in a computer. And because static RAM is very often used in the CPU itself, there's not a lot of room to put it in there. You'll see this in caches because static RAM stays that way without any refreshing, any dynamic refreshing that we're going to talk about when we get into other types of memory. So it's perfect for a cache. We can put the information into the cache and read it out very, very, very quickly. So it's perfect to go inside a CPU. But a lot of these reasons with the expense and the size is why you don't see it anywhere else in your personal computer system. There's also a type of memory called Dynamic Random Access Memory, or DRAM. We'll also hear people call it DRAM. Uh, this is what we always talk about when we talk about RAM in a system. We're really talking about this DRAM. D means dynamic. That means that the memory constantly has to be refreshed. If we didn't send some electrical pulses in there to keep refreshing that memory, which is really just a bunch of capacitors, the, the data that's inside that memory would simply disappear. And that's what, why when you turn your computer off and there's no more power to the memory, all of your memory blanks out. And that's why. This dynamic random access memory is the type of memory that we're going to see in all the other types of memory we'll talk about today. 
the first one will go in this this dynamic world is the synchronous DRAM, synchronous SD RAM. And it's synchronous. Notice that that SD RAM, it looks very similar to SRAM in the, the nomenclature and that abbreviation that we're using there. So don't confuse SD, synchronous DRAM, with static RAM or SRAM. Those are two completely different things. SD RAM is synchronous with the clock that's being used in our system, our front side bus. And that's why the front side bus these days is advertised a lot. If you go look for a new computer, one of the specifications on there is going to be the speed of the FSB. And this RAM is synchronous with that. And because we're synced up with the bus, we're synced up with the memory controller, we're synced up with the CPU, it's a very efficient way of using memory. The way that we talk about the speed of this memory, for instance, if there's a 133 megahertz front side bus, this memory is called PC133. So that's pretty easy to keep in mind. 133 megahertz clock means that it's called PC133. In fact, this is PC133 memory that I have on my screen right here. Unfortunately, this is the last time we're going to see just a straightforward numbering scheme when it comes to memory. And this type of memory really isn't used any longer. Uh, we really didn't get up into higher speeds with this SD RAM. And so we had to create new ways to access memory that was even faster. And the one that came out right after that, we've already talked a little bit about this, is RAM bus RAM. And that RAM bus RAM, DRAM came out with the Pentium 4 because you can see the front side buses were getting up even faster, 400 megahertz. And with front side buses that fast, you needed memory to be able to keep up with it. What Rambus did is license this technology. It didn't actually make the chips themselves. They just created the specification and licensed this really high speed RAM specification out to Intel. That was a very key part of this because they did not license it to AMD which means Intel had a, a way to go about having very fast memory, and AMD had to fend for themselves. Now this is also because it was licensed, it was from a third party, and it's relatively fast memory. It was also relatively expensive when you looked at the SD RAM that had traditionally been used in a system. And so when you start looking into the costs associated with it and how it was being used, it was very useful and functional. Almost everybody was using RAM bus DRAM for a while, but Eventually, this particular idea of licensing technology and having to pay additional fees for the licenses eventually died out. And that brought us to something called DDR memory, DDR SDRAM. And this stands for double data rate, which means that we were able to get information out of memory twice as fast as our traditional SDRAM. We really were gathering information on the upside of the clock and the downside of the clock. So the clock could still go the same speed, the memory could still go the same speed, but we're able to gather information twice as quickly. It was really important for moving along the speeds of our systems, which means if you had a 100 megahertz clock at eight bytes every cycle, perhaps 64-bit memory again, that means that you could move out of there 800 megabytes per second. But because we're using DDR RAM, we're essentially doubling the speed. And this is the first time that we start using this particular numbering convention with memory. We start to see this called PC1600 because we could move potentially with every clock cycle 1600 megabytes per second. Now, if, if this is something to keep in mind because going forward, this same nomenclature is used also in other types of memory. So it's a very useful term to see. The higher the number, the higher the amount of throughput that can be used to go in and out of this particular kind of memory. The next type of memory that came along is something called DDR2. SDRAM. And DDR2 introduced to us an even faster set of data rates that could keep up with a faster front side bus. What this didn't do was increase the total amount of, of information we were gathering on the, the upper or lower. We still had gathering information on the upper and the lower. But what it had is an enhanced interface. There were additional buffers. There were some drivers that were off chip. There were additional enhancements to being able to pull information off of this particular memory type, this DDR2 memory type. And if we use that same numbering convention we used before, a 100 megahertz clock transferring it 8 bytes per cycle, or really 8 uh, uh, 64 bits per cycle, that was really uh, adding up to 800 megabytes per second. So, so far that makes sense. That's what we were using before. But since this is DDR2 SD RAM, we were essentially 
quadrupling the amount of throughput that we could get from that system. This, this is uh, in, in terms that we could view. This is called a PC2-3200. And that's whenever you see the PC2, we're talking about DDR2. And the number to the right is the total amount of theoretical throughput that we could get out of this system every clock cycle. So that means 3,200 megabytes per second, or 3.2 gigabytes of traffic every second in and out of memory. You can see why it's important now to have these memory speeds go even faster because our systems need that kind of throughput in its memory. We've gone through a lot of very detailed information in this particular module. Not only have we gone through all of those different memory form factors, what all of them are, we've gone through the number of pins associated with each form factor. We've then stepped for, through all of these different memory types, which also, of course, every single one of them has an abbreviation we have to know for our A-plus exam. So if you haven't jotted them down already, you may want to go back to this or visit our website and look at our study guide that has information on what's contained in this video so that you'll know exactly on that A-plus exam when they ask you how many pins are in a SODEM. And they give you a list. You're going to want to pick the right one out of that list because there's certainly a number of questions on the A-plus exam that come from this kind of information dealing with memory. A lot of details here, so make sure you get those down. For many other videos, to participate in our online forums, or to gather information from our study guides, visit our website at freeaplus.com.